This is our third lesson on classes of plant secondary metabolites. If you haven't done so already, check out my earlier lessons on alkaloids and phenolics before viewing this one. In this lesson, we'll cover a number of different medically relevant classes of compounds from plants, focusing on terpenoids, lectins, and glycosides. Terpenoids are broadly distributed in nature and can be further categorized into mono, di, tri, tetra, hemi, and sesquiterpenes. Terpenoids contain additional elements, usually oxygen, and are responsible for plant fragrances. Along with phenylpropenes, monoterpenes are the major constituents of volatile oils in plants. Triterpenoids are rich in antimicrobial compounds with activities noted against bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoa. The sesquiterpene artemisinin, shown here, was a major contributor to the fight against malaria, and the scientist who discovered this activity, Dr. Yu Yu Tu, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for her work. Here are some examples of phenylpropenes. This includes eugenol, safrol, meristicin, and anithiol, which all contribute to the flavor and aroma of several important herbs and spices. Lignins are formed through the coupling of two phenylpropene units. One of the most studied medicinal lignins is that of podophyllotoxin, isolated from the mayapple or Podophyllum peltatum in the Berberidaceae family shown here. This scaffold has been used as the basis for the generation of synthetic derivatives, etoposide and teniposide, which are used to treat certain cancers. Lectins, on the other hand, are proteins that bind to carbohydrates and which are highly specific to sugar groups of other molecules. This binding can cause agglutination of cells or precipitation of glycoconjugates and polysaccharides. Lectins are found in many plant foods, and while some lectins are beneficial, others, such as the poisonous lectin ricin from the castor bean plant, or ricinus communis, shown here in the Euphorbiaceae family. Polypeptides are also found in many plant foods, such as fava beans, shown here. Fava beans contain fabatins, which are 47 amino acid long units that have been found to exhibit antimicrobial properties. Now let's talk about this general concept of glycosides. Glycoside is a general term for a natural product that is bound to a sugar. This consists of two parts, the aglycone unit, and this could be something like a terpene, a coumarin, a flavonoid, or so on, plus the sugar or the glycone unit. There are two basic classes of glycosides, the C and the O glycosides. The name designation refers to ways that the sugar is attached to the A glycone unit. In a C glycoside, it is attached through carbon-carbon bonds. In the O glycoside, it is attached through a carbon-oxygen bond. Many glycosides remain bioinactive until they are hydrolyzed and the A-glycone is released as a prodrug. This is a heterogeneous group with little in common besides their physicochemical properties. Classification of glycosides is based on the nature of that A-glycone unit. And glycosides are usually more polar than their aglycone parts alone, and this enables them to be more water-soluble and impact their transport to target sites in the body. Cyanide glycosides are used by plants in defense against herbivores, and these include a hydrogen cyanide unit. Cyanide glycosides are broadly distributed in the Rosaceae family and can be found in the seeds of apples, almonds, plums, cherries, and so on. These are also prevalent in the most common starch source in the tropics, that of Manahot esculenta in the Euphorbiaceae family. This is commonly known as cassava or yucca. The hydrogen cyanide content of cassava tubers is released from the plant cells during the grating process typically used in the food's preparation. Now let's talk about some other important uh, bioactive glycosides beginning with cardiac glycosides. These are compounds that have profound effects on the heart tissue, hence the name, cardiac glycoside. 
The egg like home units of these compounds are sometimes referred to as cardinalides. While some cardiac glycosides, like digoxin shown here, have proven very useful in medicine, the therapeutic window or difference between poisonous and medicinal dose is quite narrow, and great care is needed in their use and administration. Anthroquinone glycosides, on the other hand, are known for their laxative properties due to their impact on increasing peristaltic action and reduced water reabsorption in the gut. Some prominent examples include Frangula persiana, formerly known by its synonym name of Rhamnus persiana, and aloe vera. You may have also noted sinusides for sale in the pharmacy as a natural stimulant laxative, and these are actually anthroquinone glycosides derived from sinus species. Glucosinolates, on the other hand, are prominent in the Brassicaceae, or cabbage or mustard family. These glycosides contain sulfur and nitrogen atoms. A key characteristic of these compounds is their pungency, which gives them their very strong aroma. And some of these can even have irritant effects, which can prove useful in topical therapeutics to treat muscle pains. In summary, there is great diversity in plant secondary metabolites. They are structurally complex, and many have important pharmacological properties and certain classes are associated with certain types of activities. As you reflect on these lessons concerning plant secondary metabolites, I'd like you to consider how these compounds have played a role in your own health. Do you take any medications originally discovered in plants or modeled after plant compounds? Or do you benefit from any particular metabolites in your regular diet? You may be surprised at just how many classes of these compounds play a major role in your own health.